Shalom. Welcome back. Want to uh, kind of give some background on this whole presentation and the way it developed because I, I think this is like an interesting. It's interesting to me as an example of the way that this kind of took shape. Um, I started out this presentation months ago because I watched a video um, on scriptural allusions. That's allusion with an A. Um, <clears throat> and I don't remember who the speaker was in the video, but he was talking about the way that Yeshua would quote scripture. Like he will quote one single line from scripture and you're expected to understand what the rest of the scripture is, which I totally understood. I've understood that for many years. I don't think a lot of Christians really understand that aspect of it. They'll just quote a scripture and not go and say, hey, is this being taken out of context? Something which Paul does a lot. He'll take, he'll just, he'll look for a single sentence that supports his theology and he'll just pull that out of the scripture and use it in his letter. Versus Yeshua, who he doesn't expect you just to know that one sentence. He expects you to know the whole chapter, you know, I mean, really the whole book, right? Not just the chapter, but um, if he's quoting a verse, normally you can go to that verse and look at the two or three verses before, two or three verses after, and you can understand the full context of what he's saying. So, if I can find that video, I'll post a link to it, because it's a really good video. The, the, some of the, the, the hidden, or maybe more subtle, meanings of what Yeshua is saying that he pulls out of it is, is fascinating to me. Um, and so the video itself is worth watching. I, I'm, I'm sure the guy doesn't believe the way that I do. You know, he's not going to, he's probably pro Paul or whatever, but it's a great video. And the video itself was posted on this channel on, um, on I think it's on Rumble, but it's a, a guy who I met online um, several months back and him and his dad do videos. He's nowhere near as far off the reservation as far as like mainstream theology goes as i am like i think he him and his him and his father are making these videos together and i'm pretty sure they're both paulinist but they view paul more from, from what i understand they see paul as more like a lot of the way that hebraic roots people do which is that paul was pro torah which is wrong but you're not going to get as led astray as bad believing that as someone would who thinks correctly that Paul is lawless, but incorrectly that Paul was a legitimate apostle. <clears throat> so anyway, watch this video of Scriptural Illusions. I started putting together this presentation because I was wanting to look at more things that Yeshua said, where he referred back to a scripture to support his position and look at that scripture and say, hey, you know, does this like fully support what Yeshua is saying? And of course, like, I know it will. Um, but I got, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 slides into this presentation and I kind of set it aside and was working on other stuff. And this weekend I was, um, attempting to, you know, share some truth online with some people on a, um, you know, social media and, you know, naturally it turned into this back and forth debate where they were trying to use nothing but Paul to support their positions, and then I would just quote something that Yeshua said, and of course that just makes them angry, because I would do such a thing as use Yeshua to, you know, <laughs> teach the truth. And some of the things that they would quote, I mean, it's just like so just out there with the, the points that they were trying to make in their lawless theology. And it really comes back to what I was saying before about this whole thing where they hate Jesus' words so bad. And, which is interesting, you know, that you would call yourself a Christian but hate the words of Christ. And um, so this is something I made videos on recently. Um, you know, why do Christians hate Jesus' words and such and so forth. And of course they kept bringing up Peter and his warning about Paul 
in Second Peter 3.16. And they're trying to use his warning as this endorsement of, of Paul. And it brought to mind this verse in, in Second Peter, the, the first chapter, about we do not follow cleverly devised myths. And then you see Peter then he he appeals to the fact that he was an eyewitness. You know, we've made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received the honor and the glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him from the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I will please. We ourselves heard this very voice, voice born from the heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And then he says, And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, but for no prophecy was ever formed by the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And I was like, and once again, I come back to this, I'm like, I just, I just know that this is about Paul. I just know that he's talking about him right here. And... <clears throat> Well, you know, one of the points that I make in the in the video about how this is a warning, I'll, and I'll, I'll put a link to this video in the description, the one where it deals with this issue about whether or not Peter was really endorsing Paul or was he warning about Paul. I, I make the comment that, you know, Peter says that Paul was given wisdom. He doesn't say this wisdom came from God. <clears throat> James, when he writes his letter, which is a a rebuke to Paul, I mean it's a response to Galatians and Second Corinthians. If you if you take the letter of James and you compare it to things that are said in Galatians and in Second Corinthians, I mean it's obvious that James is refuting Paul. He he picks the same verse as Paul does. He 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 responds to the arguments that Paul makes. It's there's no like you know. Um, Paul in Second Corinthians chapter twelve talks about being possessed by a demon, and his Jesus won't cast it out because, like I've said before, I think his Jesus was Satan. Satan won't cast out Satan. And James says, if you just resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Like that, that I believe is him responding to what Paul was saying about being possessed by a demon, by the angel of Satan. <clears throat> James talks about wisdom being sent from God. And we'll, we'll review these verses in a moment. But And then he talks about this demonic wisdom. And I don't know, I, I feel like this all ties in. It all ties in to the wisdom given to Paul being this demonic wisdom, not this wisdom from above. In fact, if you look at the opening verses of Second Peter, Peter opens his letter by speaking to his followers, Peter's followers, and saying, you have been given this knowledge of Yeshua from above. So, you know, Peter starts off by mentioning this this knowledge that comes from God, from above, in the first four verses of Second Peter. And then when he refers to, to Paul, he never says where Paul gets his wisdom. Again, this faint praise. But I don't really want to make this presentation about about the whole issue in Second Peter, but I'm just saying that because this is kind of the way that this whole presentation developed. Because while I'm in the midst of of debating with these people online, God brings back to mind this presentation I was working on about Yeshua and the way Yeshua quoted Scripture, and and so then taking that as the foundation for this presentation, the rest of the presentation developed around this basis, this foundation of the way that Yeshua quoted scripture. So that, I guess, is kind of the story. And I feel like it's, it's worth mentioning sometimes like how these things develop because as I was putting together this presentation based upon, you know, I'll start off with this very basic presentation about Yeshua quoting scripture and then the Holy Spirit just built on it from there. And it was like, I, you know, he was... 
calling to mind verses in scripture I hadn't read in months. And, and like I would put something, I, I would put a slide together and then he would just like take it in a totally different direction and remind me of some other thing that he wanted included in this. And so th this is one of those presentations I really want to impress upon you. I believe that, that everything in it came from God himself, that he put this presentation together. I'm trying to get away from using the word teachings. Every now and then I do. Every, you know, I'll slip up and I'll say, this is you know my teaching or whatever. And I'm trying to break myself of that habit. I'm, I don't want to call myself a teacher. I'm a presenter. I'm just presenting what Yeshua, our true teacher, teaches. And this is one of those presentations. So uh, I hope that you stick it out for the whole thing because um, I believe this is what God wants you to the listener to hear today. So, without further ado, we'll move on to look at the way that Yeshua quoted Scripture. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the way Yeshua quoted it, the way that Satan, the devil, quoted it at the same time, the way Yeshua responded to him with Scripture, and we're going to ask ourselves. Then we're going to look at the way Paul quotes Scripture, and we're going to we're going to go through the book of Galatians. At some point, I would like to do. 2 Corinthians and Romans also, because my understanding of the way that Paul's letters came about, and I know it differs somewhat from like the accepted you know, scholarship that's been done, I, but I believe that Galatians and 2 Corinthians were both written after the incident in Antioch where there was a disagreement between Peter and Paul, and Paul wrote those two letters as a means of salvaging his ministry. And what he really did was he just, just destroyed it. I mean, the things that he says in Galatians and 2 Corinthians is horrendous. And, you know, I don't know when Peter wrote 2 Peter. I mean, he could have wrote it before he really fully understood how bad Paul was. And maybe that's why he doesn't really call out Paul explicitly. But I, I really, part of me kind of thinks that he wrote that after the incident with Paul. And, you know, he doesn't condemn Paul. Like in, in James's epistle, he, he writes about not um, slandering a brother. And I think that's what Peter was doing. He was trying not to call out Paul by name explicitly. He called out the actions and the doctrines of Paul in the first part of his letter. And then he finished up the letter with faint praise where he could get Paul's name in there. And the initiated, the people who understood the doctrines that were taught by the Twelve Apostles would be able to easily identify Paul as the person being spoken about in the previous chapter of, of that letter, um, 2 Peter chapter 2. But because a lot of the doctrines that were taught by Jesus and the Apostles had been kind of circumvented by Paul, we don't always make that connection. And so, like I said, I mean, and obviously, I mean, without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, the epistle of James is absolutely a response to Galatians and 2 Corinthians. There's no, I mean, it's <laughs> there's no debating it. The only people that can debate that and say that, it's, uh, that I'm wrong are people who are just completely ignorant of what those three epistles say. You know, James quotes the same scripture. He quotes all of Paul's arguments and, and turns them around on their head. It, there's no way it's, it's anything other than a response to Galatians and 2 Corinthians. And I think what happened is Paul was pretty much destroyed at that point as far as his ministry goes. And then he came up with this idea that he was going to get together some money. He was going to make an offering to the poor in Jerusalem, the Ebionites, and try to get back in their good graces. And in the in the process of doing that, he wrote the book of Romans. And Romans was meant to be an open letter that he was wanting James to see so that the apostles could be like, well, maybe this guy Paul's not as bad as he was. And he's looking for a second chance is what Paul's trying to do. That's why a lot of times if somebody is trying to paint Paul as being pro-Torah, they always quote from Romans. Well, Romans is his more or less his apology. But that being said, there's plenty of stuff in Romans that's absolutely blasphemous too. But Paul's trying to 
clean up his doctrine and make it more acceptable to the apostles because he's trying to buy his way back into the movement. And of course, this effort fails because he presents the money to James and then James says, okay, we'll go to the temple. Since you're not teaching lawlessness, go to the temple and just and pay these guys to end their vow. And I almost wonder if it's like, you know, like at times I've said I think that James was setting him up or whatever, but I don't know that, I mean, I could also see how it's maybe like a trial by fire. Like, okay, we have no way of really knowing what you're teaching other than what's in your letters. So you go to the temple and pay this and then everybody's going to know that you follow the law. And maybe in the back of their mind, they're saying, okay, well, if Paul's lying to us, if Paul's telling the truth, Paul's going to go into the temple, he's going to make this you know, pay this offering and do what he needs to do, and there's going to be no problem. But if Paul goes into the temple and he's been teaching all the Ephesians and all these other people lawlessness, he's going to get into the temple and they're going to expose him. So, in a way, it could have just been a trial by fire. Like, okay, are you telling us the truth? This is how we'll know if you're telling us the truth. You're going to go into the temple. And I strongly suspect that Paul was probably a little terrified about going in there because he knew what he had been teaching. Anyway, again, long introduction. I apologize, but I do think it's all apropos to what we're going to be discussing today. Not that I'm going to be teaching it, but, you know, God's going to be teaching it. We're just going to be presenting the information and and you can, um, and you know, see what the point is that, that God is trying to show us. So we're going to start off in Matthew 4. It says, Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was hungry afterwards. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones that they become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So when the tempter came to tempt Yeshua, he was there to tempt him into essentially committing treason against his father. Yeshua responded with this quote from Deuteronomy 8, Men shall not live by bread alone. Was this scripture, quote, was it a scripture quote that fit the context of the situation? <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8, 8, so, or 8, 1. You see where you can see in, in yellow that is the quote from Yeshua, but we'll read the whole first several verses of this chapter. All the commandments which I'm commanding you today you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which Yahweh, your Elohim, has led you in the wilderness these forty years. Yeshua had been in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's quoting this verse back from the children of Israel after 40 years in the wilderness. Definite parallel to the situation. That he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. Do you think maybe that his son was going through this same period of testing? Testing to know what is in his heart, whether he will keep his commands, whether he will remain true to his father. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor your fathers knew, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but, by, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Thus you are to know in your heart that Yahweh your Elohim was disciplining you, just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of Yahweh your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. <clears throat> Reading these verses, it is amazing how appropriate they are, how much they fit the situation. There's, um, you know, there's one thing to be said about taking scripture out of context, but to take scripture that is this much in context, to me, is amazing. It's, I mean, I, I don't know another way to explain it. <laughs> like, it is, it is perfectly within context. It fits the context of everything that's going on in the situation of being tempted to the letter. 
So now Satan follows up with a verse from Psalm 91. It says, The devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will put his angels in charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. Here's the quote from Satan there in the purple at the bottom. But the thing is, the, the chapter that he's quoting from, the psalm he's quoting from, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. Is this not... <laughs> Can you imagine like the Lucifer quoting this to Yeshua? And it comes from a psalm that's about obeying Yahweh. He will deliver. Like the trapper is quoting a verse from a psalm that tells you how to be delivered from himself by remaining true to Yahweh. To, I mean, to me, it's it's amazing how off the mark Satan is. He quotes scripture. But when you go to the actual scripture that he's quoting, it says the opposite. It tells you to resist the devil. And Satan's trying to use it to get Yeshua to submit to him. So Yeshua responds back and says, Again, it is written, You shall not test Yahweh your Elohim. So what is this? Now where does this come from? Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall fear only Yahweh your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the people who surround you. For Yahweh your Elohim in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of Yahweh your Elohim will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off from the face of the earth. You shall not put Yahweh your Elohim to the test, as you tested him at Massah. You shall diligently keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. You shall do what's right and good in the sight of Yahweh, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which Yahweh swore to your fathers by driving out all your enemies from before you, as Yahweh has spoken. Notice the appropriateness again to use this verse in this situation. This scripture is reminding us to remain true to God and not to forsake him even in the face of the adversary himself tempting you to forsake him. <clears throat> Again the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall serve him only. And then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and served him. <clears throat> so this quote that Yeshua is quoting is from Deuteronomy 6.13 and from Deuteronomy 10.20. We looked at 6.13 in the previous slide. Now we'll look at 10.20. Now Israel, what does Yahweh your Elohim require of you but to fear Yahweh your Elohim? to walk in all his ways and love him, and serve Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep Yahweh's commandments and his statutes which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to Yahweh your Elohim belong heaven and the highest heavens, and earth and all that is in it. So in the same verse that Lucifer is, is showing Yeshua all these kingdoms and saying, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms if you fall down and worship me, Yeshua quotes back this, this verse in the chapter where it says, It all belongs to God. It all belongs to Yahweh. Everything that... And, and you know, people will say, Well, Yeshua didn't... He didn't dispute that, that all these kingdoms were Satan's to give. In fact, I've probably said that before. But it wasn't until I went back and looked at this, looked at Deuteronomy chapter 10, where Yeshua is quoting from, Yeshua did tell him, it's not yours to give. We just didn't understand what was being said. When, when Yeshua quoted this, this is what caused Satan to leave. And I believe it's because he was referring specifically to verse 14. 
everything Satan was offering him, it already belonged to God. Yet on your fathers did Yahweh set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your heart, stiffen your neck no longer, for Yahweh your Elohim is the Elohim of gods, and Yahweh of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, which does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You shall fear Yahweh your God, and you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, and he is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. When Yeshua quoted this verse, the devil knew that he lost. And now you know why. <clears throat> so what about Paul? How does Paul quote scripture? I'm going to start off with Galatians. Like, like I said previously, I've, I eventually want to do this for 2 Corinthians and for Romans also because I think that those three books, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans are kind of the, the ones where Paul really goes off track. Somewhat in 1 Corinthians also. You know, he's talking a lot about things like uh, the, these things that he calls the deep things of God, like knowing that you can disobey God and eat things sacrificed to idols, which Yeshua in the second chapter of the book of Revelation calls the deep things of Satan. <clears throat> so if, if these three are kind of like his flagship type of letters, you know, the ones that really espouse what Paul believes, then these are the ones I think we should go and we should check and say, hey, does does Paul really, is he quoting these verses he quotes in context or not? Because we just saw how Yeshua did. Everything Yeshua said was perfectly in context. Everything that Satan said was out of context. And so who is Paul following? If, if I'm right, and when Paul says he was possessed by an angel of Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, then we would think that probably this angel of Satan was a source of a lot of Paul's dogma. And this Jesus that... Paul says, refuse to cast out the angel of Satan. Well, Yeshua says Satan won't cast out Satan. So that tells me that I think this Jesus, you know, in air quotes, Jesus, was not Jesus. It was not the Jesus of the Gospels. It was the it was Lucifer. It was Satan. So if, if I'm right, and Paul truly was seeing a vision of Lucifer claiming to be Jesus, then we would expect Paul's Jesus to quote, to quote Scripture the same way that, that Satan did. Everything out of context. Taking a Scripture that says one thing and using it to say another. So, it's in Galatians chapter 3 that Paul really gets into his own theology of lawlessness. And he's using certain Scriptures to support his theology. He doesn't... You know, the first two chapters of Galatians, he's more or less um, just telling his background story. He's not really quoting scripture to support his theology. It's, it's not until he gets into chapter 3. So the first scripture that Paul quotes, when he says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are faith who are sons of Abraham. So, what what Paul is using to make his point here in Galatians chapter 3 is what was decided. He's taken out of context, first of all, what was described in Acts chapter 15, where there was this debate about whether people had to be circumcised to be saved. And the evidence of that was the fact that, okay, well, these people are receiving the Holy Spirit before they are circumcised. So it's obvious that God is accepting them before they're circumcised. And so they use this to form this theology, and the council agrees to it. it you know, James was, James was the one that suggested it, that... Okay, if we're going to let them come into the congregation, we're going to have to give them some purity commands. And he said, for those that are turning to the faith, we give them four purity commands. No fornication, 
Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't eat meat with blood. And don't um, eat things that are strangled. So three of these purity commands have to do with eating. The fourth one is about fornication. And so this kind of will get the Gentiles cleaned up enough to be able to come into the congregation so that they're not a threat of bringing in demonic entities. And we see the reasoning behind that. Peter explains it in the Clementine homilies. Um, there's something called, I think it's the, the heading of the chapter or something like the, the law of unclean spirits. And so basically what it says is that a spirit, an unclean spirit gets control of you, is allowed to harass you if you do these several things. And it was the things that lined up with these four purity commands. So Jesus had taught the apostles that if you are committing fornication, if you're eating things blood, if you're eating things sacrificed to idols, if you're eating things that are strangled or whatnot, then you're in danger of being oppressed by demons. And so by James saying they have to stay away from these four things to come into the congregation to hear the law of Moses read, he was saying that for the safety of the congreg congregation. So Paul is using that decision to, you know, he's twisting it. And you can see that in the very next chapter of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 16, Paul goes and circumcises someone. So he understood what, what the decision was. The decision was not doing away with the law of Moses. The decision was about getting the Gentiles who have received the Holy Spirit just clean enough so that they can come into the congregation. And then, of course, there's this issue with Peter and Paul in Galatians chapter 2, and I believe it's totally, completely related to that. That Paul did not fulfill his agreement and did not go and tell his followers about the four purity commands. He told them, all you got to do is remember the poor, which is a lie. There were four purity commands that were given. And Paul was not teaching that to his congregation. So, so Peter had been having fellowship meals with these people, not understanding that they were not even practicing the basic purity commands that they were taught. And this was opening up Peter to being harassed by these demons at these fellowship meals that he was having with the people. And all of that is explained in uh, the recognitions of Clement or the homilies of Clement. Actually, both both of them explain it to some degree or another. But that's, that's kind of the thing that's not being told to you in Galatians. So now Peter's trying, or Paul rather, is trying to use that decision to justify his theology in Galatians chapter 3, but he has taken that decision by the Jerusalem council totally out of, out of the meaning of what's said. So, so that brings us up here where we're at now, Galatians 3.6, where Paul uses this verse about Abraham believing God and it was reckoning to him as righteousness. So here's the verse, Genesis 15.6. Now, the grammar in this verse in Hebrew indicates that Abraham was accounting it to God for righteousness, not the way that Paul is interpreting it. In fact, the grammar in the English language also supports this understanding. Because when you have a compound sentence like this, and the subject is a pronoun, he, in the first clause, and in the second clause you have the same pronoun, there's nothing in the verse to indicate that the subject of the first clause switched to a different subject in the second clause. They're both using a pronoun, so the, the subject should remain the same, unless the, con, the, the actual information in the verse tells you something different, and it doesn't. So the he that's in the first clause, he believed, should be the same subject when it says he counted, there's no, there's nothing in the verse to indicate that the subject changed. So Abraham believed Yahweh, and Abraham counted it to Yahweh as righteousness. It was because of his belief in Yahweh that Abraham understood Yahweh to be righteous. Paul is using this verse in the opposite meaning, and in in every Bible, they capitalize the second he. He counted it to him, and the him will be not capitalized because the translators and the Bible 
um, publishers, they want to protect Paul. They will do everything. They will bend over backwards and mistranslate stuff, misinterpret stuff, whatever they got to do to protect Paul. But there's no indication the subject switches. There, regardless, even if Paul was correct in the way he interpreted this verse, there's no reason to base this new interpretation of righteousness off this one obscure verse. Because there's a thousand other verses throughout Scripture that say that you, the righteous are the ones that obey God. So even if, even if you don't believe that and you think, no, 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 in this verse, the second he is referring to God, and Paul's right, you still can't really use this verse to support what he's trying to say. There's nothing in this verse that says that obedience was not required. Next, Paul goes on and said, The scripture foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And the nations will be blessed in you, so that those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Okay? <clears throat> so Paul's thesis is that Abraham's belief alone made him blessed not obedience to God and he's saying that the scriptures by saying this are foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith alone not obedience okay so let's see if that is supported by here by the original quote now this this line the nations will be blessed in you appears multiple times in scripture, at least four different times, maybe more. But every single Bible publisher in the footnotes, they will direct you to Genesis 12, 1. Well, Genesis 12, 3. Um, they don't direct you to any of the other quotes. So we're going to look at that in a minute and we're going to ask the question, why is this the only instance of in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed that they that the Bible publisher will direct you to? <clears throat> but notice that in the first verse of Genesis 12, Yahweh says to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I show you. And I will make a great nation of you and bless you and make your name great. And then he goes on. But the reception of the blessing is contingent upon his obedience and getting out of his father's house and out of this country and going where he tells him to. So Abraham, his faith, was working through his works. If, if Abraham did not obey God in Genesis 12, 1, then you would never see the manifestation of verse 3. It was because of Abraham's obedience that he was the friend of God. Not because of his just faith without works. Now, why didn't commentators, why didn't the Bible publishers direct you to Genesis 18? Because in Genesis 18, Yahweh says all the nations of the earth will be blessed by Abraham. See, this, this totally destroys Paul's argument. Because in the very next verse, For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness and justice so that Yahweh may bring Abraham what he has promised him. So the promise was not based upon faith without works. It was based upon the understanding that Abraham and his descendants would be obedient to God. Why don't the commentators direct you to verse uh, to Genesis 22? Where, again, it says all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham's offspring. Because in, in Genesis 22, it says that I myself, as Yahweh speaking, I have myself as sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this, because of your works. You have not withheld your son, your only son. 
I will surely bless you and will supply and will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and your offspring and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, the exact opposite of what scripture says is being is trying to be sold to us by Paul. He's following in the path of who? Satan. He's quoting verses the way Satan did. James himself also refers to this verse. In his refutal, in his answer to Paul's apostasy in the book of Galatians, James says, Do you want to be shown, you foolish man, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Notice how appropriate James's reference to scripture is. He quotes scripture the same way Yeshua did. James wasn't going through the scripture and just picking out verses to suit his theology. He was actually studying the scripture to get the correct meaning. That's why he was able to refute Paul so effectively like he did in the book of Galatians or uh, book of James. And finally, if the commentators would have directed the people to Genesis 26, they would have once again seen how out of touch with reality Paul is. Genesis 26, 2, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but dwell in the land where I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For you and your offspring I will give these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and give all your offspring these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Again, James is right. Paul is wrong. Paul is quoting scripture completely out of context to try and promote his theology. Next, Paul says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Quoting Deuteronomy twenty seven twenty six. However, if he read the very next verse, it says, If you are faithfully obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, Yahweh your Elohim will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yahweh Elohim. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field, and it goes on and on and on and on with blessings. He should have said, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a blessing. For it is written, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. See, if if Paul was legitimate, that's what he would have said. The law is a blessing. If you obey the voice of Yahweh, you'll get all these blessings, as it is said. And then he could have quoted Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 3. See, what Paul's doing is he's going through the scripture and he's just picking and choosing. Like he's, he's selecting out just a, a very limited verse to fit his theology. He's not reading the whole chapter. He's not reading the whole book. You know, people will say, oh, you're you're ignoring all these other ver- you're You're uh, ripping pages out of your Bible if you don't support Paul. Meanwhile, they do away with 90% of the the law, 90% of the the writings of the entire Bible in order to support Paul. You have to throw out a whole lot more stuff to to support Paul as being an apostle than you have to do to reject him as being an apostle. And like I said before, you don't actually have to reject anything. I take Paul's letters for face value and i see all the horrible stuff he says and all the good stuff he says and i say you know what this horrible stuff does not override the good stuff 
is Paul's writings that expose him as being false. His writings are the evidence that he's false. So I would not throw out the evidence. If I threw out Galatians, if I threw out 2 Corinthians, I would have no proof about how big of an apostate Paul is. But by keeping that stuff in the Bible, okay, here you have you have all the evidence you need to reject him. You don't have to reject you don't have to reject the books themselves. You just got to reject the man, the man that wrote them. <clears throat> now Galatians three eleven. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. <sighs> okay, so this is the verse that Paul is using to demonstrate to show you that no one is justified by the law. Now, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could probably find, if I really set my heart to it, I could probably find at least 100 verses that say that, some, that you are justified by the law. But Paul's going to use this one, that no one is justified by the law before God. Okay, so this is... Now, this is what, I hate to keep using the word flagship, uh, the reason I keep using it is because this is what this is what commentators say, like, this is his flagship verse, this is his thesis verse, this is what Paul bases all his theology on, this is what these, you know, the academics and even the pastors say, this, this is Paul's proof verse for his theology, that the righteous will live by faith. He uses this verse several times in his letters. Okay. So this is what Paul, now this is not according to me, this is what the, the Paulinist will tell you. This is the verse that all of Paul's theology rests upon. <laughs> and it's so funny, like, this, this verse is, um, this really demonstrates the house of sand that you have to build your theology on to rest it upon Paul. This is a mistranslation of Habakkuk 2.4. It's an obvious mistranslation. <clears throat> the word in Habakkuk 2 4 is that the righteous shall live by his emunah. And emunah is one of those Hebrew words that any legitimate student of the Old Testament knows what emunah means. If you talk to an Edomite Jew, even an Edomite Jew who does not know Hebrew, but you say the word emunah, they know what emunah is. Emunah is faithfulness. So, Paul is misquoting Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous shall live by his faithfulness. And if you notice, this is the Strong's Concordance entry for emunah. Firmness, steadfastness, fidelity. This verse means the opposite of what Paul is using it for. It doesn't mean something slightly different than what Paul's using it for. It means the opposite, the exact opposite of what Paul is saying. The righteous live by their faithfulness, by their fidelity, by their covenant loyalty to God. And what is the covenant loyalty it is demonstrated by keeping his commandments. In fact, notice 25 times it's translated as faithfulness. And every other definition there really kind of rests upon this same understanding as faithfulness, except for one. One time it is translated as faith. Guess what the one time that that is translated by faith is? Habakkuk 2.4. You see, the translators mistranslate Habakkuk 2.4 as faith to protect Paul. Because Paul's doctrine cannot be exposed. They will lie to you about translations to protect Paul. That is why I made such a big deal about this whole thing about pisteo, which is translated as belief. But it doesn't mean belief when you're talking about belief in a person. It means obedience. And so there is dozens of times that pisteo is mistranslated as belief when it should have been translated as obedience. 
So all these verses about how you just have to believe to be saved, they're all false. They are all false. It should be translated as obey. And so the translators have no problem lying to you. Shutting up the gates of heaven before your face. Because the one thing that Jesus says repeatedly you have to do to be saved is obedience. And the translators will not let you see it. They have no no care. They don't worry about what the result is. Because when you live a life of disobedience because you think all you have to do is believe and then you face judgment, the translators don't care. They don't care that you're misled into following a false gospel. <clears throat> Paul doesn't care either. This is, not, this is not unintentional. Paul had to have known he was mistranslating this verse. Had to have known. People will say, oh, he, he was just going off the Septuagint. No, because Paul will also quote the, he, the Hebrew version of the scriptures too. Paul, you know, if he was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, he knew the Hebrew, he certainly knew what Emunah meant, and he certainly knew what Habakkuk 2.4 said. Paul is intentionally mistranslating verses to lead you astray. Next, he says, However, the law is not of faith, but on the contrary, he who, pract he who practices them shall live by them. And he is quoting Leviticus 18.4. You shall follow my rules and my statutes and walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he will live by them. I am Yahweh. So Paul is citing a verse to prove that keeping the law is not about faith in God. Does this verse really support his thesis? His thesis is the law is not about faith. Leviticus 18 So Leviticus 18, the chapter, is a chapter about not participating in sexual perversions. This is the, in, the, the introduction to the chapter that tells you not to sleep with your parents, not to sleep with your siblings, not to have sexual relations with nieces and nephews and homosexuality and bestiality and all. You know, maybe this is what the apostles talk about when they say that this Paul-like figure is teaching sexual perversions, sensuality. I mean, is this really the verse you want to use to support the law being done away with? If somebody traced this this quote, he who practices them shall live by them. If, if one of these Gentile converts that Paul is speaking to were to go back into the Hebrew Scriptures and they were to find where it was, Leviticus 18.4, and Paul is saying... What? He's doing away with this stuff in his teachings? Well, isn't that Paul just legalizing all these sexual perversions that Leviticus 18 teaches about? Teaches against, rather? The ramifications of this, I mean, of all the verses he could choose, why would he choose this one? I don't know any Pauline pastor that would support doing away with Leviticus 18. Read Leviticus 18 and the stuff that, that God is telling us not to do. <clears throat> but does this support his thesis? No. Well, I mean, James, for one, refutes it. Can faith save you without works? No, faith without works is dead. Jeremiah, like... You know, he, he refers to this faithless one Israel because she is committing these spiritual adulteries, idolatry and uh, fornication. You know, a lot of these idolat idolatrous religions, the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, a lot of this stuff had sexual worship practices involving orgies and stuff like that. And so Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 3 repeatedly refers to Israel as the faithless one because of her adulteries. Paul says the law is not of faith because of this particular text. 
he who practices them will live by them. I mean, that doesn't prove his theology. That doesn't prove his thesis. That doesn't, you know, he who practices them shall live by them has nothing to do with proving that the law is not of faith. I don't, I don't understand where Paul even thinks that that verse demonstrates that the law is not of faith. But you can see where Jeremiah says faithlessness is these acts of adultery that Israel's committing. So it sounds like Jeremiah thinks that the law is of faith because the absence of the law is faithlessness. All through the, the Torah, God speaks of obedience to his law as a way we show that we love him if we love him and keep his commandments. So if you're not keeping the commandments, that's an act of hatred toward God. You know, the opposite of love is hate. People don't keep the commandments because they have no faith in God. They keep the commandments because they do have faith in God. This is ridiculous. Galatians 3.12 is absolutely ridiculous. It does not support his theology. Not at all. And before we move on, I want to point out what Ezekiel says about this same theology. He, he kind of um, he, he, he quotes that passage, and not really in a direct way, but he's obviously referring to it. If he does what is lawful and righteous, he will live by them. Very similar to what we, you know, to this <clears throat> passage. But Ezekiel 33, yet your people say the way of Yahweh is not right. When in their own way that is not right. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does iniquity, and of course iniquity is lawlessness, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and righteous, he shall live by it. But you say the way of Yahweh is not right. O house of Israel, I would judge each of you according to your own ways. Ezekiel 33 completely destroys what Paul is saying. By the way, when it says turns turns from your sin, you know, sin is lawlessness. First John uh, 3, I think it's verse 7, says that sin is transgression of the law. If you're not keeping the law, you're embridled in sin. Moving on. Now, Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of spirit through faith. Okay, so Paul says Jesus was a curse because he hung on a tree. But the verse he is quoting from Deuteronomy 21, in the context of the verse... It is not that you are cursed because you're hanging on a tree. You are cursed because you committed a crime punishable by death. It says, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree. You shall bury him the same day, for a hangman is cursed by God. Why is he cursed by God? Because he, he committed a crime punishable by death. It's not just the fact that he's hanging on a tree. And Luke says Pilate found no guilt in him deserving of death. Even Paul in Acts 13.28 said Yeshua was not worthy of death. That verse doesn't apply to Yeshua. Yeshua wasn't cursed because he hung on a tree, he was an innocent man. He did nothing wrong. He was not cursed. Every account of the crucifixion says Yeshua did nothing worthy of death. Luke, I mean, Paul himself, according to Luke, Luke says that, that this, this bottom quote, Acts 13.28, uh, this is Paul speaking in Acts. He's, he's cursing an innocent man. I mean, what a sort of blasphemy that is for him not to be afraid to say this about our Savior. Yeshua was an innocent man put to death. He was not cursed. 
Galatians 3.15, Brethren, I speak on terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. He does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. Okay, so in Hebrew, Hebrew is like English in the in the, the fact that um, seed is always singular. The only time you use seeds is if it is a small number of seeds that you could actually count. But like if you get a big bag of seed, you don't say I've got this big bag of seeds. Like I, you know, we had to plant some grass out in our pasture this year. I bought a big 50 pound bag of grass seed. I did not buy a big 50 pound bag of grass seeds. Uh, people don't, people don't say that. Like, and it's the same thing in Hebrew. When you're talking about an innumerable multitude of seeds, you don't say seeds, you say seed. Now in, in Greek, it's not like that. In Greek, you would actually say seeds for like a, a large multitude of it. So Paul is kind of stretching to try and say this, that is referring to just one seed. What I'm saying is this, that the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on promise, but God is granted to Abraham by means of a promise. We've already seen that that's wrong. I'm not going to go and pull back up the the scriptures again, but Genesis 18, 18 and 19, you read it, you'll see that it was that Abraham was promised all this because he was obedient, not just because he believed. We've already, um, that's already been refuted in this video. Uh, Galatians 4.21, tell me you are, um, who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondswoman, one by the free woman. But the son of the bondswoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. Okay, so <clears throat> Paul is now, he says he's speaking in allegory. But the thing is, it's an allegory which makes absolutely no sense. There's no way you can use the texts that he refers to as supporting his allegory. Um, in this particular section of Galatians 4.21, Robert Eisenman he says that this allegory it will, first of all, be disgusting to any descendant of Jacob. But Paul is an Edomite, and he is linking this chosen status back to Isaac and demonstrating that Jacob is the one of the bondswoman, which leaves Esau as a sole heir of the new covenant. Uh, Eisenman states that the only reason Paul can get away with this is because the people he is telling this to are Gentiles who have probably never even read the book of Genesis. So they really have no, almost no choice but to just eat up whatever Paul says. Um, if they were familiar with the scriptures that he cites, it, it would be obvious that Paul is just, he's full of it. They're, they're this, the text does not support what he's saying. <clears throat> so, so it says that Mount Sinai is bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. But Hagar was the mother of of um, Ishmael. Ishmael had nothing to do with Mount Sinai. Ishmael was not there. Jacob was there. So Isaac was the father of Jacob. So see how this allegory doesn't work? Like He's trying to say that the descendants of Jacob were... The, the sons of Hagar. It makes absolutely no sense. And so he quotes this verse here in the purple. Well, the verse in the purple is from Isaiah 54. So this is one of those instances where when I was researching this passage, I was like, how, okay, so how exactly do you prove a negative? Because there's no evidence 
in Isaiah 54 or any of the chapters around it to support Paul's allegory. It doesn't support it at all. So how do I, you know, like, how do you prove it's negative? Do you want me to read like, like, you know, the five chapters that surround this verse to prove that it's false? There's no evidence. There's no support for this, this uh, interpretation of this verse. <clears throat> He's trying to use Isaiah 54 to prove that the new covenant is one without law. But the covenant is for the people of the original covenant. Um, you mean you can see here in verse six. It's it's Israel. The covenant is for the people of Israel, but this is are the people that Paul says are the slaves that are the daughters of Hagar. There's no way that you can make Paul's allegory make sense. It doesn't make sense. He's he's having to turn the entire Bible on his head to make the the story of the Bible fit his stupid allegory that he's just making up. <clears throat> I, I don't know. I mean, if, if you want to pause the video and go to Isaiah 54 and see if you can figure out how in the world Paul is using these verses to support his, his stupid allegory, then have at it. But there's absolutely no scriptural support for what he's saying. Now, but if we're going to talk about the New Covenant, the New Covenant is most explicitly mentioned in Jeremiah 31. So does Jeremiah 31 say that the New Covenant is going to be lawless? Because this is what Paul is trying to, to propagate. He's trying to say the New Covenant is going to be one without law. The original covenant was this bond of, of um, having to follow the law and it's slavery and you're going to be free from this slavery and you're not have to keep in the law. But you read Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the new covenant, when it's mentioned, it is in green. The old covenant, when it's mentioned, is in blue. <clears throat> it says, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand and take them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. So it's not going to be like the covenant that they broke. Now, is it not going to be like it because they're not going to keep the law? Or is it not going to be like the, the original covenant because they're not going to break it? I can tell you the answer is because they're not going to break the new covenant. They broke the old covenant. The new covenant is not going to be broken. And he tells you why. But this is the covenant, new covenant, starting in verse 33, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my Torah in their inward parts, and, my, and in their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. <clears throat> so you're not going to break the new covenant because the law will be written on your hearts and you will follow the law. Now the same people... Who will, who will tell me that the, the law is written on their hearts will also tell me they don't have to keep the law anymore because it's written on their hearts. That is not the context of what these verses are saying. He's saying in the context that you will keep the law. You, you will be obedient. He says, I will remember their sins no more. Well, the sin is a transgression of the law. There's not going to be new sin. You're not going to be living in sin in this new covenant says, if these ordinances depart from me, from before me, says Yahweh, the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. So, this, if, if God does away with his commands, the seed of Israel will also cease from being a nation. And all of his other covenants are broken. Jesus Christ himself says, not one jot or tittle will fall from the law until heaven and earth pass away. So if heaven and earth have not passed away, not a jot or tittle has fallen from the law. The only things that have fallen from the law only appear that way. According to Peter and the Clementine recognitions, he said, or I'm sorry, the Clementine homilies, he says some things appear to have been fall, have fallen from the law. But those things are stuff that was never in the law to begin with. It's stuff that was added to the law.
But the original Torah that was given by God is still in full force and effect. And, you know, Yeshua explains that. It's explained in the Clementine Recognitions that there are some things that are added to the Torah. A lot of it comes from the Code of Hammurabi. Those things were never part of the law to begin with. They're additions. So, yeah, that's like the stuff that Yeshua seems to be speaking against the law, where he's like, You've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you to give you know, mercy, justice, and forgiveness to each other. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that comes from the Code of Hammurabi. Um, but the New Covenant, according to Jeremiah, is obviously not lawless. Because God says he will write the laws on our heart. The Holy Spirit is the source of the law written on our hearts. Which is why the same lawless people today are the ones who, uh, you know, they demonstrate not having the law on their hearts. And they're the ones that will usually ridicule you if, you'll, if you tell them that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to all truth. They will ridicule you and call you a fool and they've done it to me. It's because they, whether they have the Holy Spirit, I can't say for sure, but they certainly are not listening to the Holy Spirit. You have to actively listen to it. You can't just, um, you know, follow after whatever you want to do. And, and I do believe that, at, at times I, I believe, and I'm not really sure if this is cor correct to understand or not, but I really think that what we call our conscience is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And a lot of people ignore their conscience and they don't understand that that's the Holy Spirit. But that little voice in the back of your head that tells you that you need to do the right thing, that's the Holy Spirit. And um, and I also think that if you constantly always ignore that voice, eventually he'll, he'll probably keep quit talking to you. Or you'll just get to the point that you don't listen. But a lot of the... Um, the vitriol and the anger that I experience from people who don't want to keep the law, when I point out that Jesus said we should keep the law, I really think that that vitriol and anger is not really directed toward me. They're angry because they hear that little voice in their head saying, you know, he's right. And they have this like almost overwhelming urge to argue with you about it. Because I got to tell you, I spend... Not a whole lot of time, but I do spend some time looking at other, you know, videos, uh, you know, that Christians make online or, um, you know, uh, reviewing different chats and various Christian groups on social media. And 90% of the time, I don't really even comment on them. I see that they're wrong. Some of it is just unbelievably wrong, some of the things they say. But then when I do, it's usually because I'm trying to turn people back to what Yeshua said and not toward what Paul said. And you always get a whole lot of pushback from it. And it's like, why can they not just... Like, I, I couldn't imagine having the, the lack of um, self-awareness to start arguing with someone against following Jesus' commands. One guy, to, to, in fact, it was just today, he said, where in the Gospels does it say that we have to be obedient to be saved? Like, can you, I, I, for me, I cannot imagine the level of a lack of self-awareness to even ask that question. This person who claims to be a, a Christian He's one of the, he uh, actually also said that he was one of these uh, King James only types. And I was uh, kind enough to inform him that the King James version is a horrible, horrible translation. But he, um, he was the one that came back and it's like, so where does it say in the New Testament we have to obey to be saved? And I, I think that that says a lot about his heart. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine having the audacity to ask such a thing. Even if you believe that, I guess one thing to believe that is another thing to say it out loud. I was watching a TV show one day, and this guy was, uh, he was talking to his boss, and he says something to his boss, and his boss is like, well, yeah, I thought that too. But the thing is, I didn't say it. I didn't say it out loud. 
Um, it's one thing to think that obedience is not required, but another thing to say it out loud. It's outrageous. Moving on in Galatians uh, 4.28, And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But uh, but as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bond woman, woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. <clears throat> so then, brethren, we are not children of a bond woman, but of the free woman. So here is another statement. Okay, so Paul is saying that this is what the scriptures say. Well, the thing is, it's not, this is not a commandment coming from God. Paul is continuing to apply this bondwoman to Jacob, but he's citing scriptures about Ishmael, not Jacob. This is what he's quoting. He's quoting a statement by, by Sarah. Cast out the slave woman. With her. This is not God saying that. God didn't say cast out the slave woman. Now God does say, you know, don't be displeased, but go ahead and do what your wife says, and I'll take care of the boy. You know, the, the I think the context of what God is saying here is he's he's not as um, it's not the same spirit of. Meaning, when, when Yahweh says it in verse 12, as what Sarah's saying. Sarah's saying it is because she's angry and, and probably a little bit jealous of Ishmael. Abraham didn't like it, and God says to Abraham, don't be displeased uh, because of the boy um, and his slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, just go ahead and do it. Um, and he says, I'll take care of him. I'll make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he's your offspring. So you don't get, like, I don't get any type of indication that, that Yahweh doesn't like Ishmael or doesn't want Ishmael to be successful or, or whatever. Like, he's, he's still going to take care of Ishmael. Paul's quoting something that Sarah said in a moment of anger. And it's almost like he's, it's almost like he's trying to apply it to, like, this is what God was saying. But that's not what God was saying. Um, this this whole allegory that Paul is trying to to make is is there's no scriptural support for it. <clears throat> and then Paul uh, and and keep in mind like all of this crazy stuff that that Paul's saying it's it's just in like three chapters of of his book, and he gets this far off base with some of the stuff he says. Galatians five uh, fourteen for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, it's Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, nowhere in Scripture, as far as I can find, does anyone claim that the law is fulfilled by only this command. Yeshua says you shall love others the way I have loved you. But he doesn't say that that replaces the, the Torah. He says this in Matthew twenty-two thirty-five, 35, when he's asked, what is the great commandment of the law? And he says, the great commandment is, you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And he says, the second command is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Paul is saying that the, the entire law is fulfilled in this one command. Jesus says there are two primary commands, but the other commandments, they all hang on these two. Every law in the Torah is about either loving God or loving your neighbor. It doesn't mean those are the only two commands. And I've heard Christians try to say that. Jesus did away with the rest of the laws. Only these two commands remain. That's not what he's saying. He's saying all the commandments depend upon these two. So you have these two basic commands, and then all the other commands are telling you how to do this stuff. James um, answers this ludicrous statement by Paul. He says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbors yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. 
For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So in other words, if you break any of the commands, if you, if you break the command, do not murder, then you have broken the command, love your neighbors yourself. And you're, and you're guilty. The commands are not done away with. They just hang upon the two greatest commands that Yeshua gave us. Paul is lying if he says the whole law depends on that one commandment. <clears throat> so that's all the scriptures that Paul explicitly quotes in the book of Galatians. Brings us back now to where we started. Is Peter talking about Paul? He says, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So what he means by the will of man, that means that you're trying to make the verses fit. Paul is taking verses from the scripture and he is twisting them as hard as he can to make them fit his theology. But the thing is, when you go back and look at what he's quoting, he's obviously twisting the meaning of them. But this is what is truly meant by taking scriptures out of context, what has been demonstrated today. What Christians think taking scripture out of context is, is using the scriptures to expose Paul as a liar by demonstrating the context of the scripture. I think I've thoroughly demonstrated the context of what Paul was quoting, and I have shown you that he was quoting them outside of their intended meaning. That when Whoever wrote the book of, of Genesis, whether it was Moses or someone that came after Moses, the author of the book of Genesis did not intend for the things that he wrote in the book of Genesis to be used the way that Paul used them. The same way with the book of Deuteronomy. The author of the book of Deuteronomy did not intend any of those verses to mean what Paul was try, trying to twist them to say. We could go through the rest of the scripture, all these other once they quote it. That is what it means to take something out of context. So yes, I do think that this is exactly what Peter is talking about here. James also says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So this is how you get the wisdom from God. I mentioned at the beginning of the video, got a little ahead of myself. But uh, this is the reason I include this is because it's referring to, I wanted to use it to refer to what Peter was saying about this wisdom given to Paul. You see, the book of Galatians is a rebuke of Paul. So there's two types of wisdom being shown here. The one that comes from God that you ask for. And then James mentions a different kind of wisdom later in his book. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do, do not boast and be false to the truth. Don't take scriptures out of context to try and make you, them fit something they don't. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So, I pray that this has been a blessing to you, that's given you some things to think about, that maybe some of the verses that, that people are using to support Paul's theology don't actually support, don't, they don't actually say what they were meant to. And when you compare the way that Paul quotes the way that he uses certain verses 
and you compare that to the way Satan did and the way Yeshua did, it's pretty easy to figure out who Paul's teacher is. And none of the apostles are exempt from this. But the thing is, when James quotes scripture, he quotes it correctly. He keeps it in context. When Peter quotes scripture, he keeps it in context. When Paul quotes scripture, he uses it to mean the opposite of what the original author of that same verse meant to say. And he has no problem with changing verses. He has no problem with, with inventing them, you know, words full cloth and, and inserting into the scriptures that were never there. <clears throat> and if you think the translators are going to expose him, you're wrong. We just saw at least three different instances where they'll bend over backwards to keep you on the plantation, keep you from learning the truth. So thank you. I pray this has been a blessing for you, and I pray that you will learn the truth, and the truth will set you free. Shalom. Goodbye.